In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Lily Wilson, a veterinary surgeon that's created a new way of helping horse owners take the very best care of their equine partners. So Lily has a wide breadth and depth of passions and expertise. She's worked in a practice treating pets, horses, and livestock in a variety of settings, including general practice in a hospital um, as a, an emergency clinician and volunteering overseas. She's also done her postgraduate programs in ecosystem health and in advanced veterinary practice. So her special interests are species appropriate husbandry, anatomy and locomotion, pain physiology, ethical training, and mutual beneficial coexistence of people with the natural world. So Lily is now combining her passions into a service that guides animal guardians to nurture all round well-being and partnership. I think you are going to really love this conversation. So here we go. Episode 118 with Dr. Lily Wilson. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Well, hello, Lily. Uh, Welcome to the pod. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to talk to you uh, because I think what you're doing is so, so needed uh, for so many people. Uh, So I'm really happy to kind of dive into this. And I think you're going to help a lot of people um, just by the podcast and by what you do. So again, just thank you. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yay. Yeah. So what you, what you're doing now, uh, you're calling a hybrid veterinary advice and coaching service. So I'd love if you could kind of just describe like what that means, <laughs> what, you know, cause we all know we call the vet and then they come and they look at our animal and then they leave. So what's a hybrid veterinary advice and coaching service? Okay. So, um, what I've kind of noticed with my veterinary work so far is that, um, well, for one thing, is that us vets are usually very busy. (laughs) So um, sometimes it can feel like a bit of a, not necessarily a rushed thing, but you have all of these different bits of information to kind of amalgamate together. And then you have often some quite difficult decisions to make from that. Um, And I think that's, sometimes it's really clear it's it's easy the information is there it's easy to know what's going on and what to do about it Uh, but sometimes it's quite a lot more complicated than that and what the coaching part of the service is so the consultation part is the is the normal veterinary stuff but what the coaching part is is if that is if the if the either the information gathering the making a decision from that or the implementing the plan from those two stages is proving difficult. That's what the coaching stage is for. And I think this actually applies to all species, but very much so with horses. Sometimes it can be confusing to find out what's going on. Um, And we kind of have all of these different options, many, many different paths that we can choose to go down, often expensive, sometimes involving invasive things um occasionally or not occasionally very often um involving stress in cooperating with those procedures even if they're not invasive um and so sometimes we it can be overwhelming to know even which path to try to begin with and you often find that people go down lots of different avenues and sometimes actually get even sort of more and more confused as they as they do this scattergun approach of lots of different 
diagnostics or um, going off down rabbit holes of reading, which is great, by the way, <laughs> um, but doesn't necessarily always bring you to um, the answer that you need in that situation. And then the second stage is making a decision from you can collect a lot of information. You can see a lot of excellent professionals. Uh, but sometimes it's difficult to actually make a decision what in my unique horse's case and in our partnership's case and in your own circumstances as well. Um, and I think there's often a lot of shame around this or guilt sometimes as well. You know, um, there's unfortunately in the horse world, there is a bit of a culture of you should be doing such and such. And it's all, you know, it's it's all unique to your own individual situation. So that's where the, the coaching part of that comes in is um, uh, part of it actually will be just an, a way of approaching decision making. And then part of it is to know when you need to look for more evidence and when you need to sort of apply more feel or intuition in the situation. Um, and then there's also the um, uh, implementation part uh, where you might need help preparing your horse to um, realise that an intervention is um, not going to be as uncomfortable or as frightening as as they, they think it is. <laughs> yeah, so there's <clears throat> there's so much here. And I think we can start to get this picture. I mean, I think this is true of any kind of healthcare, human, <laughs> horse, dog. I think we've oh, all absolutely. been in, yeah, we've all been in this situation where stuff is happening. You know, you have your one vet, and if you're lucky, you have a trusted vet that you you known and you know their whole big picture. But often we come in and they're like, "Oh, this has happened. Do this." But then you might have another part of your team, and they're like, "Well, do this," and. And then, you know, but maybe you can't do it. They're like, you got to put these eye drops in, but your horse is fighting with you. And, you know, there's so many things that happen after the vet even gives you the diagnosis, <laughs> you know, like, well, it's this. Yes. And here's what you need. Good luck out there. So, I mean, and I've experienced this with, you know, human healthcare with other animals. And so when I found out more about what you're doing, Lily, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so needed. I mean, I'm, I'll am i probably be booking my own appointments with you because things get complicated. And when, you know, I have some experience, but you know, when, when I feel like I'm in the middle of all this information and I'm not an expert, right? I'm not a vet. I'm not a doctor. And I've got to somehow hear this different information from different experts, take what I've Googled, Take what my other trusted friend with a similar issue did, all this stuff, and somehow I have to put it together and do it in a way that I can feel a little bit of confidence in what I'm doing because every situation is so unique. So I love that as a, a veterinarian, you're standing up and going, I get it. And, you know, you're, you're making yourself available to be someone to be like, Hey, let, here's an outside person who is an expert who can look at all of this and help, help put it together. <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, I think it's not, it, it, it won't necessarily be that, uh, this will help to get you on the only correct path straight away, <laughs> you know, but it'll, it's, it's following a way that, um, well, one really important bit is that the the path that you choose will align with your own values. And that in the process of doing the finding out or implementing the treatment, you can preserve or maybe even improve. That would be nice. Um, but at least preserve your partnership with your horse. You don't feel like you get into a fight or a a conflict in and that's really easy to do because you know you really want to follow the instructions and and make your horse better and it's I've I've been there you know it's worrying when your horse isn't well and um you've had the advice and you want to implement it um so yes it's a 
it's a way of um, approaching it in it in a way that will be less. Um, I mean, I think traumatizing is a bit too strong a word, but for for everyone involved, it's a bit more affirming. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think sometimes it can be traumatizing. I mean, sometimes we get, you know, the advice of like, this horse needs stall rest, you know, and sometimes they do. But, you know, because and we'll talk about this more as we go, you know, you know about horsemanship and, and the connection with the animal as a as a being. So, you know, it's not just stick them in the stall and then you know, but there's things you can do and to, to nurture that relationship as you're doing it. Um, well, maybe before we get too into it, can you share a little bit about um, what you what you were doing before? And how did how did this shift happen? Right? Because you were just like a vet. <laughs> and now you're doing this. So ex- tell a little bit of that story. Yeah, so the the horsemanship stuff came before I went to vet school. But I kind of left it behind in, um, you know, the, the pressure of, of becoming a vet, met much, much study over several years. And then uh, there I was being in general practice. So after graduating, um, I worked in mixed practice for many years, interspersed with some volunteering in various um, clinics overseas, horse and donkey working, working equid clinics and um some neutering clinics and then I've done some emergency clinic work as well um in a that's it was in a dog and cat hospital so I I've done yeah mostly general practice since graduating but these themes come up everywhere (laughs) um one funny thing actually is um we sometimes be having these conversations with my colleagues um about whether you know you'd say do you know when it feels like you've you know you've definitely made the difference in the case as opposed to sometimes it feels a bit like they maybe got better in spite of what you did (laughs) rather than because of what you did (laughs) and (laughs) Uh (laughs) uh, because sometimes it's so confusing all of the information that's coming in and then um client compliance is a big thing that you know you give a you come up with a plan together and then um the client goes home and is unable to follow the plan so does something different so it's you see them back for a recheck and maybe they're better but not because of what (laughs) you thought might be the the plan um and and, uh, all sorts of combinations of that but I started to think about it a lot more. Um, wh- when is it that we really know that what we chose was the right decision? Um, and it, so, so that's one one part of it is is kind of being able to evaluate your progress in a an objective way, but a way that's tailored to each individual. Um, and the other thing was that it it felt not very nice to be implementing a plan using, I mean, chemical and physical restraint are necessary a lot of the time for safety of everybody involved, including the animal. Um, But to be doing that in not a very conscious way, you know, but mostly because you're busy, you have a whole a whole list of patients that need your help so you you have to squeeze them in um and so you you do it and uh I'm not suggesting that um it it's done in any kind of um knowingly unthinking way it's just that you can get into a a habit of how you do things um and I and I just started to consider it how does this part of it affect them um it's quite interesting that a um a significant source of trauma in people is anesthesia and surgical procedures and um we don't often think about that we think about the health condition that's at the root of that 
but maybe not the interventions that we've carried out and even just things like giving wait and- wait a second that's that's so interesting i'm sorry to interrupt um <laughs> no, we'll talk more about that the the way that went more well, the tra- yeah. there's trauma from anesthesia yes so in people people can suffer post-traumatic stress disorder after surgery and anesthesia um, I think a large part of it is because it induces such a deep um, freeze response of the nervous system. And I started to notice that if you have a patient that goes into an anaesthetic in an anxious state, they come out in an even more anxious state. And people sometimes report back, um, you know, that their their animal has been a bit different for maybe a few days afterwards that could be, I suppose, attributed to various drugs still being in their system. Um, but some people even report that they're different for months or that they're never the same again. And that tends to be, because we we don't know very much about it, it it's difficult to go any further than you've noticed that. But um, it's something that I keep seeing, that the, the things that we do to help them through their health conditions maybe have longer or further reaching effects than than just on that health condition. So I decided to start That's finding out more. So interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I think um huh. th- yeah, the the sort of the immobilized state that we achieve sometimes is a true Sometimes it, I mean, it is truly helpful. You need to have, obviously, a, an appropriate plane of anesthesia for an, an operation, for example. That's that's definitely needed. Um, but the state in which they go into it is the important thing. So everything that happens leading up to it, and especially in horses, because they can do this immobilizing th- themselves, and um, if you're not sure about reading it, you you might just gloss over, oh, they were fine, they stood still for the the preparation and the pre-medication and everything. Um, they might be actually in a terror state and um, and that is heightened when they when they come out. That is so interesting. Um, so I learned something new right off the bat here. But you know what you what you were <laughs> saying about um you know, veterinarians and, and really any healthcare professional and the time, right? They've got, they're busy. And I had experience here, um, one of, you know, for just some shots and one of my horses, um, can be a little funny with shots. Um, but if I take a minute, I can have her relax and I teach her head down and, you know, I just have to prepare and set it up. And, uh, one moment, uh, one time a vet came and it wasn't my normal vet, um, and I, she just was like coming in and they're get really good at like getting that shot in, even if the horse is, you know, they do it faster than the horse can resist, but the horse is still anxious. And I managed to catch it. I said, Oh, wait a second. And then I did my, you know, cue and I, you know, got him, got her to put her head down. And, um, and then the vet got all excited. She's like, Oh, you know, positive reinforcement. Oh, you know, and she got all, she's like, yeah, yeah. And then we were totally a team. She knew it. Excellent. She liked it. She preferred it, but she didn't offer it mm. because she figured, you know, probably most owners. So that was really interesting. And it really made me remember, like, I've got to be the advocate for my horse, you know, and just, and all I, all it took was me going, wait a second. I did this one thing and she was totally on it. So, yeah, I think just that, you know, the the owner, you know, make that take the time to prepare your horse. And you just gave some really good reasons why, even if you're going to have to ultimately sedate or anesthetize them, like have ways of creating that calmness and having the initial, you know, inoculate, you know, shot or whatever it is that they need to be as calm as possible. Mm. And but to speak up, because sometimes you know, like in this case, the vet was so happy that I did that, but she did not educate, you know, she wasn't educating people or offering that mm. to owners. Cause she was just like, oh, I'm just going to get it done. Yeah. Having the conversation, that's a huge thing because I think 
you know, we can, a lot of us can be thinking it and then it doesn't, um, it doesn't get spoken. And partly that's a time thing. I think a lot, like you say, have to get it done and then, and then go on to your next patient. Um, but it, in the long run, yeah. it's, um, well, actually it's quicker anyway, <laughs> in the long run to prepare them as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And another thing on the subject of injections that uh, it's actually so horses often have intramuscular injections. So for, for vaccines, they're intramuscular. Um, sedation is often intravenous, although it can be intramuscular. But for both, you have to inject through a muscle. There's less muscle to go intravenously, but both you have to put the needle into muscle tissue. In terms of how painful a shot is to have, if there is any tension in the muscle, it actually, if you've ever, um, you know, had injections yourself, you'll, you'll know this. When the nurse or the doctor prepares your arm and they, they give it like a little soft massage, they're talking to you, you're, you're not feeling too nervous. Sometimes they even do it when you're not anticipating it. So you don't even have any of that unconscious tensing. And then it's, it's hardly, you hardly notice the needle going in. If you were to, don't try this because it's unpleasant, but if you were to tense up your arm <laughs> and they were to do the injection, it really hurts. And um, sometimes you get horses reacting explosively to injections and, and people will sort of think, oh, you know, it's just a tiny needle. Um, they are likely to be truly feeling that degree of pain if their neck is like a slab of concrete when they have the needle in. Um so preparing them so they know what the the procedure is or the or the game <laughs> is a is a good way of of approaching it um will help with just having relaxed muscles for it um or even even just a pause i mean sometimes if if it's you know if it's urgent and they're not prepared occasionally you do have to dive in quick to to make sure that you get the the injection done but ideally um even just it as long as they're not going to be disappearing off, if you can just do a pause and their neck muscles are a bit more relaxed, um, the injection is likely to be a lot less aversive. Yeah. Yeah. And if, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you can get it done, but, and it seems like, oh, I got it done. Uh, but then the next time the vet comes, you know, you're just, they see the vet and they get tense because now they don't trust it and it could come out of nowhere at any time. Absolutely. So I think preparation is ultimately as much preparation as can be done as possible. Um, so, so maybe um, I can, well, so seeing these kind of circumstances and seeing these kinds of things happen is, is that what helped, what started you on this path of like, Hey, I think there needs to be, uh, I need there. I think there's another a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah. So there were all of those sort of gathered thoughts that kept on, I, I kept, having them they kept cropping up with with multiple situations but it was actually um my wonderful youngster Sonny who I got him as a yearling so he's um nearly three and a half now and um he has been an amazing teacher to me and really what he made me realize was um that I was kind of coping with my situation um and actually quite shut down myself so being a vet is emotionally pretty hard you know um <laughs> there's there's a lot of stuff that that happens that's difficult to to deal with um and i realized that my coping strategy was to keep those feelings at an arm's length and uh, and he he really was the one that showed me that <laughs> Um, and I, I found this amazing community of horse people. So I kind of came back to the horsemanship stuff. Uh, so it started off with Warwick Schiller and listening to his podcast, in fact, and that's how I found you. Awesome. Um, and uh, all sorts of loads of other, yeah, um, amazing people that I found. And then I thought, well, hey, this, this, this stuff that I keep on thinking about, let's actually do something about it. So, um. So then I, I started to do more um, study into these areas and um, 
and have practiced. Sonny loves the um, positive reinforcement stuff. He he gets the game now, so it's <laughs> whenever we do a session, it's like, oh, which thing is it this time? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's cute. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that's been the catalyst really for me changing my approach and um, going down these various rabbit holes. Nice, nice. So, what what is your background with horses? Because you said you yeah you started doing the the horsemanship even before you were doing horses even before you started vet school. So yeah. Yeah, so not um, not very much for any for you know professionally for any money, <laughs> um, but yeah. So uh, I got I got a my first project horse at age fifteen, um, and it was like oh go from having a pony on loan uh, to and having riding lessons and everything um, to a uh, a Welsh cob who you can't look at or he'll be he'll be off like 50 acres away (laughs) he was so terrified of people (laughs) um but that's what I wanted I wanted to um I wanted to learn all of that (laughs) the connection stuff and um figure out how I could make him realize that it was a safe place to be around me and other people um so he's he's like my first big teacher in that regard um, and then um, I did some courses on the classical seat with uh, Heather Moffat here in the UK of Enlightened Equitation, um, synchronising with the horse's movement. She's got an excellent, very straightforward way of explaining what you need to be doing with each body part, basically, in order to absorb the horse's movement. So um, I started off... a riding instructor qualification with her and I did some teaching just on the when I could ever grab some time during vet school um and I learned some um I did a saddle fitting course with her as well and then I'd just be kind of you know doing all of my vet stuff and then every now and then when I had some time I'd dive back into the the horse stuff and um so classical dressage is a real fascination of mine in terms of it's very much like physiotherapy for horses, I think. (laughs) Um, So I'm so interested in how that can affect their health and well-being short and long term. Um, The the influence of saddle fit, um, I'm doing more study on um, foot balance and then... um, I'm really interested in how that ties in with uh, their whole body posture and then dentistry as well. Mm-hmm. I haven't actually been a 100% equine vet at any point in my career. I've mostly done a mix of species. Um, but I think that's quite good in the fact that uh, I have a, a, a wide range of settings in which, in which I've worked. Um, and certainly with pets, the the horse owner connection part is you know that's very much at the forefront and we can sometimes lose that a little bit I think with horses so I think that's helped actually yeah. for me not to get too far away from that part yeah I think so too and I think it's in any area of life I think we can get so narrow focused so easily and sometimes someone just a little peripheral can see things clearer you know we just are in this narrow focus and um, I've uh, connected with uh, Jennifer Zelligs a lot Um, she's an animal trainer and she works she's worked with all species but she was currently working with um, sea lion she had a sea lion place and she has these videos of so much fun Oh my gosh, like this, you know, trained the sea lion to open its mouth. And at one point it got like, it had a tooth pulled and had like 17 different injections in its mouth. And the vet's there doing this procedure and the sea lion is on a, you know, not anesthetized, not sedated, just holding. And, you know, you look at that and you go... Oh uh, yeah. And then think about the struggle to like get eye medication in your horse or, you know, all the ways that we yeah. make this, you know, situation stressful. So 
I think it's really good to look outside the narrow field of like, well, this is just how we do it with horses because maybe there's a different way. And, you know, you see something like that where it's so built on the partnership and the connection and cooperation and, you know, all of that. And and just like you said, now the, the animals, cho- you know, consenting to be there. And so there's probably less pain, you know, so you get into this mm-hmm. feedback of like, all right, let's take a unfortunate situation and how can we do it as best as possible? So I wanted to kind of. Mm. Oh, that's a good subject in. too. Yeah, I know. So I want to kind of get into like, let's get into the meat <laughs> of your approach. So um, on your website, you talk about um, the deep roots for mental, emotional, and physical health. And you have these four sort of categories. So husbandry for happiness, movement medicine. So you kind of alluded to that, you know, the classical dressage should mm-hmm. be physical therapy, uh, cultivating comfort. And then number four is communication, compassion, and consent. These four things make me so happy. And they especially make me happy (laughs) when they're being talked about by a veterinarian. (laughs) I mean, you're so much more than just a veterinarian. But this is so important because it's the whole picture. So um, I'm going to let you just run with that now and share a little bit about what you mean by these deep roots for health and uh, and your approach. Okay, yeah. So um, I've identified these four, I think they're, they're a good framework for, um, you know, where does something fall on in, in within those four categories, they do blend together. That's, um, that's an important thing. So, um, on the husbandry for happiness side, um, basically that's an, that's another thing actually I was noticing with all species in my vet work is why has this health condition, why has this disease come about? Um, in vet school, they, they teach, uh, there's a, there's a variety of approaches that they come from. One is a body systems approach. So you'll, for example, you'll learn about the digestive system for a few weeks and then you'll learn about the respiratory system and then the cardiovascular system and you'll keep coming back and you'll layer upon layer upon layer. When you do the clinical teaching, so um, the, the, the disease part and the treatment and surgery and things, um, you often switch a bit more to species. And I would notice that in our teaching, when it came to exotic animals, uh, so the category birds, reptiles, amphibians, that kind of thing, um, the cause of disease was always husbandry related. So not quite the right diet, not quite the right housing, not the right temperatures, that kind of thing. That's also the case a lot of the time with livestock. So if you have a calf pneumonia problem, you probably have a ventilation problem in the barn, for example. That's the root of it. It's not the the bacteria is or the virus is what's inducing the condition, but the root of it is that there's poor ventilation. Funnily enough, we don't seem to go to that level when we talk about horses and dogs and cats. We do a bit, but not not quite to the same level. So say, for example, if if a horse has got gastric ulcers, um, there will probably be a discussion about forage, but it might be one sentence. <laughs> um, whereas if it was in livestock and you had uh, a rumen acidosis problem, you would look at the whole group, you would look at the ration, you, you know, you'd see what maybe got on in the mixer wagon or... Um, and and I was thinking, why why do we do that? <laughs> why does that happen? <laughs> um, and I think for one thing, it is like you say, it's it's just the way we've always done things, and um, and it there's almost no no need to question it in a way. But so what I've noticed really is that every single health condition can be traced back to some lifestyle factor, really. I mean, obviously you have, you know, accidents and and things that aren't, but for the most part, if it's a chronic condition, 
it's there is an unmet need somewhere in in their lifestyle and you can treat them with the you know evidence-based recognized treatment and if everything points to you needing to do that you should but maybe also explore why did this arise in the first place um maybe deeper than we normally do so yeah they caught an infection but why was their immune system not enough to prevent them from catching that infection um or maybe maybe they got stressed during travel well why did they get stressed during travel (laughs) they don't have to (laughs) um so yeah in terms of the 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 lifestyle factors um the forage freedom and friends phrase is incredibly helpful that that just about sums it all up really um but i could talk about more about forage if that sounds good because i think it has such yeah far reaching yeah yeah absolutely so <laughs> um forage is more than just a physical well-being a contributor to physical well-being um it also has impacts on cognitive well-being and emotional well-being so um in terms of physical well-being um it affects the digestive system on various levels so the digestive system goes from the horse's mouth where they prehend and chew the food down through the stomach the small and large intestines and then to coming out as dung the other end now the Most of the digestive system is very muscular and forage affects the muscles along the entire stretch. So having a variety and um, enough forage throughout the day and a variety of different types of forage will affect um, the jaw muscles, um, the muscles of swallowing, the the stomach and the intestines moving the forage through their system. Um, It will affect the amount of saliva they produce. It affects their metabolism. Um, It affects what else moves through. So if they're taking in, um, for example, if they do take in a bit of sand, but they have enough forage that their gut is working, the muscles are working well, it's probably less likely to affect them than if they take in some sand and they've their digestive system is static for most of the day. Um, it also affects their muscles of locomotion because usually having adequate forage means that they're not confined all of the time. I mean, you can obviously, you can keep them confined and, and provide ad lib forage, um, but often the two go together. Um, and the grazing or browsing head positions also affect their top line muscles their limb muscles and and those things so that's a a quick (laughs) run through of many of the physical aspects um the things that i actually find i mean i find all that fascinating um oh and foot balance as well because the the position of their whole body will affect how their feet grow and that's not even looking at the the content the nutrient content that's actually in the the food that they're eating so that's just the forage part Um, But yes, the thing that I find incredibly fascinating is the effects on cognition and emotions and then how that will feed back into all of those physical things as well. So um, cognition, you might not necessarily have considered this, but a horse in selecting their forage, that's, that's a problem solving game or activity (laughs) um and the horses will do this all day you know when they're free ranging they'll be they'll be investigating things and then they'll be making decisions so shall i shall i eat this bit um how long shall i stay here for when shall i move on um that's a huge area of enrichment that we can sometimes deny our horses by either confining them or by only feeding them one thing um little caveat there is that if you you know if there is a health condition that you know of that requires a very specific diet then that's important but the aim is to get back to a good variety 
Um, and the the emotional side of things, if they're not confined and they have good access to forage, it normally means that they have the freedom and the friends part. So that's that's a big part of the emotional stuff. But eating forage is very self soothing for horses. So it's actually a way of them feeling safe because it's what they're supposed to be doing. And taking that away, even for a short time, so um, it, it only actually takes about 10 minutes without forage for there to start to be changes in their metabolism, which is linked to emotional changes that even can signal, in some cases, a starvation state. So if you're having trouble, for example, um, achieving weight loss, it might be that your horse is, is without forage for only 10 minutes and that's enough to maintain the, metabol- the, the metabolic state that means that they hold on to all of that extra weight. Um, and that, that's an emotional thing. It's, it's a, an a, emotional thing affecting their physical being. Um, those are the bits that that I, I get really excited about it because it's <laughs> well that's that's really fascinating and you know I have um, I have two my two mares are, you know the grass is so rich here and I've had two horse two of my mares who have had laminitic episodes and um, one is too big and we have trouble with weight loss and so I've played around a lot with different. Um, forage strategies and so they're on a dirt track and I you know so I had to be off the grass and I mean so here this would be like an example of when it first started happening I'm like we cleared the back paddock of the barn and there's a little space we got the them off the grass I'm like okay there <laughs> now they're safe they're not eating the grass um but then it's like gosh that's boring so I spent a lot of money fixing some fence lines so I could have a dirt track that went around this big pasture and it had a lot of variety and the fence guys hated me because I made them make the fence curved (laughs) instead of just running the straight line so I wove around you know trees and things and then um, we play what I call hide the hay net right it'd be much easier just to have like a hay feeder and there it is there's the hay it's always right there Um, but we do um, hide the hay net so we put it all you know they're their allotment of hay and we put it in different hay nets and we put them in different places. And sometimes we put them close together and then they have to like do the socializing, you know, negotiating. And sometimes they're really spread apart. So they have to deal with, are they going to be alone? Are they just going to watch the other horse eat or are they going to share? So there was a lot of things that we found we could do just around these horses that are on a, you know, a dirt track, but give them lots of variety, sun, shade, um, weaving paths, decision making, because the water is only at one end, right? Decision so they gotta making. Like, so we mm, decision is, making, and, yeah. and um, the horses that you know, I have this horse Teo that I got in, who was, um, you know, he's about to be put down for behavior issues, and he had no choice. He went from his stall to the arena to work to a stall to arena to work, and one of the things I noticed with him <clears throat> when he started getting acclimated to my place is you know, to watch him go be in the stall and then the door was open. He had a back paddock and then that paddock had a gate to another small paddock and he would just walk. He'd like, I could stand here. And he's like, oh. no, I'm going to stand there. And he, it was, it wasn't like a stereotypic kind of, you know, fence walking. He would just be like, I'm here now. And now I'm here. I'm going <laughs> to walk over there. And he'd literally just like, I'd watch him making decisions. Mm. And it just it was like, oh my gosh, this horse had never been able to make a decision like that for the past, you know, four years of his life for sure. So yeah, that's got to have a a health issue. It's empowering for them. Yeah. But I had never Mm, thought about the... It'll definitely have an effect. Yeah. And I never really thought about the cognitive part. You know, we just did that because I thought it was like fun and interesting, but you're right. It's, it's, you're training your brain. If your brain never has to make a decision or think mm. about anything it just you know you lose it you're you're <laughs> yeah and it'll impact on your training for sure because if they if they're um used to either not yeah if they're used to not being able to make any decisions on their downtime 
and then we suddenly they have to make a lot of decisions in your in your training sessions yeah that's a that's a hell of a mode shift you know <laughs> right right yeah because I mean really for training they, they have to be bold they have to try something that they don't know what it is yet <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so interesting yeah oh goodness yeah I love that all right so what um what about the cultivating comfort what's that ah uh, yes so um basically pain pain having a very far reaching effect on well-being on on all different levels as well so um we focus a lot uh it, at vet school we focus a lot on pain relieving medications um and um so yes pain relieving medications and sort of protocols for acute versus chronic pain that kind of thing um which medications will ha have the best effect with the least side effects um that's all really important but where um where i find that it gets very interesting and very effective is again the the cognitive and emotional side to this so pain is inextricably linked with fear it it always is because pain signifies actual or potential damage to you um so there's a, there's sometimes this um question of is a horse in pain or are they anxious or afraid um and the, the answer is probably always both you know if there if, if there is some pain there then there will be some fear if the pain has been successfully alleviated the fear may not have gone and then we get into a bit more of a complex thing where um pain doesn't necessarily have to have the presence of any lesions any physical lesions to still be very much real and the degree to which you suffer from that pain is a function of your emotional state yeah. so this way i'm going to pause cuz like that's like <laughs> let that sink in yeah it's the the pain does not necessarily <laughs> equal injury or damage yeah yeah and it might even equal past injury or damage and that has resolved and the pain pathways so that the nervous system is amazing in how it processes pain if you have chronic pain and significant in terms of how it was for you so the significance to you as an organism um you will have an area in the brain that's actually been turned over to being dedicated to that pain. So say, for example, you've successfully treated some stomach ulcers and the horse is still girthy. That doesn't mean that they're pretending or that they're just anticipating. They may well, even if you have resolution on a gastroscope, they may well, well still have pain there because the, their nervous system needs to release the pain um and the the thing that makes it significant often is not just the biological so the biological process of sensing pain um it's you have a nerve ending stimulated it gets converted into an impulse it can be modified a bit by the um, peripheral and the central nervous systems as it gets to your brain and then you consciously perceive it but the experience of it that's the important bit so if you uh, there's loads of studies on this in people where you you have the same level of painful stimulus whilst holding the hand of someone that you trust and your experience is totally different to if you're alone in the hospital room or actually importantly if you're holding the hand of someone you don't know and have no 
basis for trust with, you still have those feelings of apprehension and, and no feeling of connection. The experience of pain is a lot more aversive. So the cultivating comfort, there's one part of it is addressing pain. Um, and another part is actually detecting it in the first place. That also requires often there to be a level of, um, I maybe won't say trust, but um, horses are prey animals. And you also see this in non-prey animals. In dogs and cats, this happens too. Um, you don't want to show any sign of weakness. That's just an instinctive, all species do that. If you're in pain, you try and hide it. Um, what I've really found is, is if I communicate my awareness of just small changes in behaviour in an animal, and this is very powerful in horses, but I've also found it in dogs and cats, then all of a sudden they're oh, they're let down the barrier that they're they let like their guard down, and then they will show you that that's where it hurts, and you're you know you're you can be palpating or you can just be watching and and they'll they'll think okay yeah you're you're you know this is is safe to show you, <laughs> so that's the other wow. part to the cultivating comfort. That's. <laughs> That's so cool. And that's so different the way you just described that than what a lot of horse owners will hear from vets, which is, you know, you know, you know, your horse, you know, he's not quite right, right? You just know it, but you can't really figure it out. So you call the vet and the vet says they're not lame enough. Work them until they're limping more so that I can see it which is going to, you know, decrease trust a lot mm -hmm. of times. So that's, that's really interesting. So you're trying to strip away the defenses and the compensation and all that and just let them like, just show me. I love that. That's yeah. a whole different way of approaching it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And what I want to try and figure out is how you can combine that with choosing our diagnostics because the reason why they have to be a certain level of lame is so that you can then abolish that with nerve blocks for example that's that's one reason yeah because if they're only if you can hardly see it and then you nerve block them and then you can't see it then it's like well maybe they've yeah. just trotted <laughs> it off or maybe it's the nerve block <laughs> like do we carry on or so yeah that's the difficulty and um so that's what I really want to try and work on it as well, actually, is to to figure out ways that you can combine those two. Because sometimes it is necessary to, yeah, the, these conventional processes that there is a reason behind them. Um, Absolutely. But I think it's it's it will be so powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, let's just look at it and let's see what else you know, what else we can do. Mm -hmm. So I just love that there's somebody like you thinking about what else can we do? So, you know, more choices. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, let's, let's move into the number four on your list, the communication, compassion, and consent, which I love that you combine those into, <laughs> you combine three things into, into one, but I think they're connected. They are very much so. So, yes. yeah, what can you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is really about um, how you're approaching these situations. Um, so I'm trying to think uh, the, the best way of saying it. Um, so maybe I should start with the consent part, actually, because that really relates to the it's very much tied in with the cultivating comfort point. Um, so consent, um, I think there's, there's some debate over whether that's the correct term in animals, but uh, I mean, you know, we see it in action uh, where um, we we proceed in a certain way and the horse will allow us, willingly allow us to do something. 
Um, right. Yeah. It's what I'll, I'll call it permission. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's just like, okay. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually I recently went and did some training with, uh, Peggy Hogan in the U S who, um, she, she does a lot in the field of cooperative care for horses and had a real aha moment because she was saying, um, this is, this is really important that, um, when you're working on consent in cooperative care procedures, um, contrary to a lot of the the positive reinforcement, so that's the the she she uses positive reinforcement methods. Um, often you get a horse that's really excited about the behaviour, um, but in this you you don't have to get them to the stage of loving it. That's that's your agenda. <laughs> that's not theirs. They you know, they, they just don't love it. That's the bottom line. Um, but it's so powerful to let them give you the go ahead signal at least. And they're so generous. They will do that. And like you say, with the sea lion, they will let you do that to a huge degree. Once they understand what, you know, the concept that you are giving them the choice. So, um, the consent part, it when combined, so the the communication gets you to the part where they can give you consent, um, and really consent is as a result of the horse feeling safe and seen, really, and that reduces pain as well. <laughs> so, um, it, for, on a much deeper level than say for example i was talking earlier about relaxed muscles for injections but it reduces pain um actually on a biochemical level you'll have oxytocin release which has an opposite effect to cortisol which one of one of the stress hormones um you can cope with stress a lot better when you have the presence of oxytocin um and and, and also it is it becomes a learning opportunity so rather than like you were saying earlier, you might get something done, but next time it's going to be difficult. Um, yeah. If you have consent, then, yeah, they might not enjoy the procedure, but it's unlikely to be worse next time around. <laughs> um, and sometimes that, <laughs> sometimes that can even, you know, there are things that we, yeah, there are things we need to do, which are not very pleasant sometimes. Um, but they're, they're so unbelievably generous and forgiving and that they, they know, they know to their core, you know, <laughs> I think what, what it is that we're communicating yeah. to them when we're conscious of it. Yeah. I totally believe that. I mean, I've just seen it too many times. You know, I, I can relate to what you're saying. I have, um, I'm actually really historically terrible about getting about needles for myself, <laughs> like embarrassingly so, but you know, it just <laughs> is what it is. Uh, but um, so, you know, I get, you know, my blood work done. And so I've had lots of chances to get practice with this. And I mean, I literally used to have Dana have to come with me because I'd be, I'd be faint afterwards. I couldn't drive mm. home. <laughs> uh, so I played around a lot with this. Now I can actually go get my blood drawn all by myself. But what um, I used to do would I would go in and I'd be like, get all in my head and I'd like try not to look. And I was just blocking, blocking, blocking and I could do it, but it wasn't as good as when I started going in. Now I go in and I like crack some jokes and I talk to the person and I ask them about, you know, how's your day been? Any weirdos come in today? And they're, oh, they'll just talk. <laughs> and now I have a connection. Right. And then, right. and then I'll say, you know, you know, I used to pass out when I got this done and, and then, you know, they'll laugh, but then they, they, I don't even have to ask them to like, cause I used to say, be gentle with mm. me, you know, but that's the only thing I would say, but now they're like, it's like we, we have a connection and most of the time now it's like not a big deal. And then if there's somebody else who won't engage with me, it mm. hurts more. Like the last time I went in, this woman did not engage. She was clearly grumpy. My defenses went up. 
oh my god and she didn't care and it yeah, hurts so and, it hurt she, and i said that hurts and she's like oh yeah and she didn't modify what she was doing at all mm. <laughs> so that sense that she i had a sense that she didn't care because we didn't have a connection it hurt a lot yeah so did it actually hurt you know was it her technique worse or was i Anyway, so I've experienced this whole thing of the power of just figuring out what I need to feel a little bit of like, hey, we're doing this, we're connected, you care about me, and that's no problem. So it, yeah. it's, you know, it's got to be true of horses and animals too. Absolutely. I mean, we're animals, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so cool. Yeah. So yes, the the compassion bit is a is a big <laughs> it's a big yeah. subject yeah 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 um so yes I thought I'd just talk about that on its own because it's so it's so huge <laughs> um so there's a couple of things that I've been I mean this is a massive subject but I've been pondering it a lot um actually I have it written down here the NHS the National Health Service in the UK they have a definition of compassion as applied to healthcare, and it is how care is given through relationships based on empathy, respect, and dignity. It can also be described as intelligent kindness and is central to how people perceive their care. So that's exactly what we were just talking about just then. Yeah. And it, it has a wow. physiological effect. So that, that definition doesn't include that, but it certainly has a physiological effect as well as, you know, it's not all in your head <laughs> uh, as uh, as yeah. as people might might say yeah um well and you know another... and the whole all in your head thing is sort of oh sorry is no the, go ahead. the all in your head thing is sort of powerful it it's like i think um you know like the placebo effect you know we all talk about the placebo effect like oh it's just a placebo effect it's like no what the hell that's the placebo effect you know you just had a group of people who got the same curative effect <laughs> from a sugar yes. pill <laughs> yeah like how that isn't like to me this is like no this is amazing <laughs> oh my goodness yes <laughs> your perception yes yeah <laughs> changing your physiology yeah and so so medications new medications have to be better than your intention in healing <laughs> your brain healing your body <laughs> you have to do a trial that proves that yeah, the medication yeah. is better than than that um yeah <laughs> it's just so funny because then everybody focuses on the medication i'm like wait 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 let's go yeah. back to the part where i just thought it <laughs> yeah <laughs> anyway so uh you had more to say about compassion sorry <laughs> yeah so um i've recently read a brilliant book um you might know it dr Kristen neff self-compassion it's called it's brilliant. Um, oh, I, I highly know. recommend yeah, it. I'm writing it down though. Yeah. Uh, so she talks about the three elements of self-compassion. And this is, you can, if you talk about compassion, you, I guess you can just put the self bit in brackets. Um, and it's self-kindness, recognition of our common humanity, or if you're talking between people and animals, maybe our sentience, uh, and mindfulness which I love this definition that she uses, holding our experience in balanced awareness. So compassion, when applying compassion in this veterinary sense, I think that all three of these elements are so important. Um, compassion, um, it's, it's not fluff. <laughs> You know, it, it's <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> opposite of fluff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think it really it demands that we take action, uh, effective action. And this, I mean, all three elements are so important, but this last one, mindfulness, holding our experience in balanced awareness, what that does, I think, is it allows us to both it allows us to see the situation for what it actually is. So not diminish it and not overblow it either. Both of those things are quite easy to do when when you're worried, when you're scared about the situation. 
um, when you're not sure what to do, you know, you, you might have reached the limits of your ability or your knowledge or or your emotional capacity to cope with the situation as well. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to practice it. But um, I loved that that was in that definition because um, I, I was reading it. And I was like, yes, <laughs> I think I was in the airport, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I thought that, oh. that that was that was such an important and when you hold an experienced and balanced awareness, that's being present. So when you're with your horse, then if you're present with them, then you can notice things. Then they know that you see them. Then you have attunement and then they will let you know stuff. So I thought I was like, oh, wow, it ties in. <laughs> so, yeah, oh that's why gosh. I just wanted to talk to yeah. the, talk about that um, component love it yeah and it's so easy to get in uh, strange mindsets when the the animals that we love are hurting yeah and not quite right you know oh, it's, it's, so it's easy just to either want to put blinders on or get so so optimistic you're not seeing what's yep. actually happening you know, or be so negative that it's, you know, gloom and doom and you, you lose hope and you lose that curiosity to try to um, hold. So I think that's, that's amazing. I, you know, to, to hear you describe it, a talk about compassion in this setting with the health of our animals. It's like, yeah, you've got to be right there going, okay, yeah, here's what's happening. Yeah. And you and will be much more effective for your animal if, if that's how it's difficult to do, but it's well worth practicing. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. So let's shift a little bit. Um, I mean, I think, I think I know I, I, I'm willing to bet our listeners are, are relating to this and can see the value. But if you were to say like, if there's somebody with a situation, like who do you help? Like how does someone know if what you're, offering you know your consult your coaching services like how are they going to know like okay this is for me like I, this is what I need yeah so um this might be a good I good place to talk about the I kind of alluded to them at the beginning um but the the sort of the three principles that I follow in in um okay helping yeah. helping people so um, it doesn't matter which stage of the chain of events you're at, um, whether it's figuring out that there is something wrong <laughs> um, or, you know, you, you're concerned that maybe health and well-being might not be optimal um, or whether you know that there's a problem but you're having trouble reaching a diagnosis. You've got a diagnosis and you're not sure which decision you should make about a plan you have a plan and it's you're finding it difficult to implement it um either maybe it doesn't align with your values or you're finding it difficult to carry out the behaviors um you know giving the medication or doing the foot care or whatever it is um and evaluating whether it's working <laughs> so um this is not as a replacement for your usual vet. This is to work alongside your your current team. Um, and it's really to, uh, it's the, the coaching side of it is to help you, help to guide you through all of the massive information. So there's all of this advice and information out there. There's loads of really excellent information out there. Um, and it, it's going to be, looking at your unique situation what are your kind of hopes for the the outcomes um we can talk about whether that's doable whether it's realistic and um yeah how how far we might get along that road um which are your values that you really do not want to compromise in getting there um and then that's how we will come to the path so the three the three pillars, I call them um, attuned assessment, first of all. So that's that's the using 
giving your horse a safe space to um to help them to show you what's going on um and actually just slowing down the assessment process so if you're nearer the first part of that chain of events with a health problem then I can give you things to do that um, will help you to notice or will help your horse to show you what's going on for them. The second is wholehearted decision making. So that's knowing when you need to look for the evidence base, when you need to kind of follow your gut feeling about things. Um, That's all to do with what are your what are your sort of red lines and that, that you won't, you don't want to cross? Um, and really what's your, what's your goal? Because um, of course it's that your horse is going to get better, but just digging a bit deeper than that really. Um, and does that affect our decision-making process? And then the third is ethical implementation. So how can we proceed in a way that, preserves the relationship and the horse still feels safe um and trying to avoid these inadvertent um you know negative outcomes like say for example with um with being traumatized after an intervention that's the, all, all we're trying to do is is help and and then you get an inadvertent ill effect afterwards so um not promising that 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 will be totally eliminated but at least we can be conscious and put steps in place yeah nice oh that's that that's awesome that you broke down those categories and stages so clearly um i think that just just having that described those different stages um really helps people to know where they are cuz sometimes it can feel like just a big swirl of hmm. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, if if a vet, if, if someone's vet was open and willing, is are you able to sometimes speak with with them? Because oh, I can see it, it. You know, depending on the ego, it could be confrontational. But are are you open to, you know, sometimes hearing it from the vet themselves if the owner yeah. doesn't feel like they can describe it well enough? Or yeah, always yeah vet or farrier or dentist or whoever needs to yeah needs to discuss the case I'm, I'm always happy that's to do awesome. that that's awesome that's yeah. awesome and so how does it work like how does it work is this I mean you're you're in the UK but um you know is this online do you come to their house like how how does it actually work if somebody yeah. wants to to contact you yeah, so it's all online. Um, so you book a slot through my website and then we do it over Zoom. If that's difficult, we can find another um, platform. But basically, it's a it's a video call. Um, it can often be good to have the horse there. I mean, in the first session, it might just be that you you want to talk and um, and, you know, get all the get it all aired and and figure out where we want to go and then we can always we can do some things with the horse there as well um it's usually so it's up to 45 minutes on the video call which is um that's basically um that's to actually get into the the real meat of the conversation when you book it there's a form that you can fill out that includes the ability to upload uh, photos and video actually if there's something that you think might be difficult to capture at the time um and all sorts of background you can put in about um their their current lifestyle their diet um any recent changes that kind of thing so it's helpful to give as much information beforehand so that we don't have to spend a, too much time um, on on the background first, and then I'll make um, when we've finished. I'll send a sort of a like a report, which will summarise what we've talked about because we might have gone through a lot of stuff. So then we'll agree at the end on what would be a good plan of action as the next step, um, and then you can you know you can check back in or. Um, I'm also going to be running um, some Q&A calls over Zoom. So for follow-up, you can either do more video calls or if it's um, if you just kind of 
have the odd question, then you can submit them for Q and A calls. And um, I will. I haven't got it up yet, actually, but I will have a members area where you can have access to recordings. So they'll oh, usually nice. be on a particular topic. So if you submit a question, then you'll know which one, which recording to go and find. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So your website is nurturingnatureequine.co.uk. And I'll put a link on my show notes and so people can find it. And um, I know you have if for those of you listening to this episode, right when it comes out, uh, you're doing a QA and a on November 19th, right? Yes. Coming up? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're if you're one of these people that listens to this pod as soon as it drops, uh, go check out her website because you can join her next um, Q&A. And if you're listening to this after the fact, just on her website up at the top, there's a thing that says um, upcoming events. So you can click on that. And uh, there's, it's a beautiful website. It's so clear and just, you know, I think um, really easy to navigate. So well done on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. Is, is, <laughs> Is there anything else? I mean, there's so much information and I'm, like I said, I'm so happy that you are out there doing what you're doing. But um, if you had a message that you'd like people to hear, something that could, well, what, what would be a message you'd like to tell people? I think it would be that if you do really feel like there is something wrong, then then there probably is, <laughs> you know, trust yourself on that because um, I, I do come across a lot of people who are maybe concerned that they're uh, somehow, you know, making something up or being neurotic about it or something, you know, it's, it, even if it's small, if you, if you have a feeling that there's something that's not quite right, it's well worth investigating it. And um, it might be, challenging to investigate in terms of like we were talking about earlier um if you need there to be certain clinical signs or changes on x-ray or you know that's when sometimes we can't find it because it's not there on those on those kinds of methods um but it doesn't mean that it's not there <laughs> period you know so um <laughs> Yeah. Trust, trust your gut. If you think that there is something not quite right, then, then, then you're probably right. And if you feel like an approach is not quite right, that's really important. If you feel uncomfortable about an approach, if it seems to clash with your values, then that is, that is absolutely valid. Mm, so important. Yeah. Cause I think there's a lot of people who feel stuff and they're like, Hmm, just doesn't feel right, but don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lily. Thank you. I have a feeling we could talk for a long time. I think I'll have to have you back. <laughs> Would you come <laughs> back and do another episode sometime? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this has been fun. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, um, again, it's um, nurturingnatureequine.co.uk. It's Lily Wilson. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.